This is Success Beyond the Score, giving insights and tips to help you learn how to build your music career from the best in the field by Millicent Stevenson. Millicent is a multi-award winning saxophonist and endorser of Harry Hartman's Fiber Reads. She is currently serving on the Executive Committee of the Musicians' Union. With over 40 years experience in the creative industry, Millicent has honed her performance and business skills. She provides personal development training and coaching via her online platform, successbeyondthescore.com. Hi, and welcome to Success Beyond the Score. I'm Millicent Stevenson, and thank you so much for joining me. Today, I'm interviewing another great guest. She is Anna Brooks, who is a professional saxophonist, an international touring and recording artist with the Brooklyn Funk Essentials and also the Jules Holland Rhythm and Blues Orchestra. She's a music arranger, music director, music preparation specialist and singer. She teaches at the Birmingham Conservatoire, but she's also a mother of sons who are twins and they are 20 years old and at university. Now, Anna plays soprano, alto, tenor and baritone. And today we're going to hear which is her favourite sax, how she balances family commitments and touring, whether it's important to have a degree in music. And she's going to be really honest about dealing with her mistakes when playing and what it's like being the only female in the band. Now, at the time of this recording, it was during lockdown. And so everything was done over Zoom. So if you're watching or listening, there will be a slight difference in the sound quality of the show's introduction with the interview. But the information is A+. Here is Anna Brooks. Listen, it's so fantastic to have you here um, to come to my podcast, Success Beyond the Score. No, um, it's a pleasure. The first season was just very much me giving information and stuff. But this time I want to interview people who I know are doing really well in music. And um, it's not to say that it's been an easy ride for you, because I know it hasn't. But mm. I think it's really good to hear from people that we don't always hear from. And mm -hmm. people have got a lot to give, you know, and a lot to say and a lot to guide. So I'm just really focusing on people in the West Midlands for a change. Hooray! <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And uh, that's why I wanted to have you. And of course, you've taught me sax as well. And those lessons were fantastic. Oh, <laughs> bless you. So there's lots of stuff we have in common. But, you know, I'm yeah. going to be asking you questions, which maybe I know the answer to, but people out there probably won't know the answer to. Mm -hmm. so, and I, and mm -hmm. it's just for them to help them find their way in the music industry. Yeah, sure. So we are going to kick off, Anna. We're going to kick off. Now then, okay. uh, I love your jacket, by the way. That's the first thing I can Thank you. Say. Thank did, you. Which country did that come from? That's Actually, it's from Chelsea Market in New York. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so I went there um, for to celebrate my 40th a few years ago uh -huh. and um, and splashed out on a couple of, like, they've they got some amazing designer, little, you know, niche yeah. kind of boutique places. And, oh. yeah, so this is, a, this is a New York one. Wow, well, that's really <laughs> nice. And that ties in really well with your sort of interview international work but yeah. I wonder how do you here's a first question how do you describe yourself now we're not talking about the past but how would you describe yourself now um in the musical world oh, sorry in, in the musical general, world yeah obviously in the if you musical want to yeah. world um I would describe myself as a I'm a I'm a saxophonist primarily um I am also I also do a lot of um, vocals so I'm a saxophonist um who I'm a I'm a, a touring and recording artist. Okay. Um, I'm also a music arranger, um, musical director. I'm not doing any musical director work right now because there's no theatre shows out there, obviously <laughs> that are yeah. that are that are requiring my services. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm a professional saxophonist who is um, an international touring and recording artist amongst wow. other things. All who right. also sings. <laughs> we also sing, and obviously yeah. there's a person behind 
all of that. Who was mm-hmm. who was a, a mother of two adult boys? Yes, <laughs> I think they're adults now, aren't they? Just they're twenty. Boys. Yeah, wow. I have two twenty-year-olds. Wow. I know, I know, it's crazy. Yeah, but I'm still. It's still very much um, hands-on. I, I still give them a lot of help. They're both at, at uni, yeah. um, and they both have ADHD. So I'm basically their PA. Oh, so no. um, <laughs> from all, you know, organizing things and diary, and I sometimes feel like I have two jobs. One is. Yeah. Um, one is my job as a musician and the other one is as a personal assistant to two 20 year olds <laughs> but, <you're laughs> but I love every moment of it and I wouldn't yeah. change them for the world they are it, it makes them who they are and they're, they're fantastic yeah. they're, they're so funny they're so clever and uh-huh. but they need a bit of extra help you know yeah yeah I mean that might be an interesting direction to go into before we even get into all this music because you're still that female musician who is a mother yeah two 20 year olds and you've still got to do your touring and your arranging recording and your directing so yeah. how do you kind of balance balance that um well it's interesting because this year has although it's been um you know terrible from a work point of view mm. um it's it's been great for me because i've had more time and and headspace to be able to to help the boys with everything mm. um because i've been around so much more mm. um and one of my sons is in his final year at um leeds conservatoire as it's now called so it's a really crucial year for him and he as he's studying music i'm able to 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 sort of you know give him some guidance and and some help and normally when things are very busy and i'm touring and recording it's really a case of if i'm on the road i will get up and i will call the boys check in with them you know check in with the family see how everyone is and you just have to do it on on the on the road right um you know you just have to to grab those moments lots of facetime and um grab those moments when you when you can um i i got a bit of a um a sort of a, a reputation or rather the boys got a bit of a reputation recently the last bit of touring that I was able to do was um with Jules Holland and his small band rather than the the, the big orchestra and so it was um it was just Jules and Ruby Turner and we yeah. were touring with Katie Tunstall yeah. and Louise Marshall and myself and, and the drummer and every night before we went on stage we'd be yeah. backstage you know just a small group of us and I would get a call from one of the boys saying oh mum can you send me some money <laughs> <laughs> and literally and and and, they, and the band would start saying oh finances you get a call and someone would go finances yeah like, yeah right, that's right <laughs> because i manage i help them manage their money um so it's not my money it's their money but i help them manage it so that it doesn't all disappear you know? yes i know um, i know and yeah yeah and and actually and that's at their um, at their request they at some point they said look can you can you help us with this because it is yeah. difficult budgeting and you know when yeah. young people go to university and they're not yeah. They're not grown-ups yet. They they need help, right? Yeah. So yeah. um yeah, it can be all time. I can be in the wings in between songs sending money to, <laughs> to literally, that's no exaggeration. Um oh but that's fine by me because it's what we do as mothers, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's you true. do whatever whatever your children yeah. need, you know, to, to help them get that's that's what you do. And um So yeah. So let so let me ask you this one. Yeah, so have you ever had to go on stage? but feeling a little frazzled because you've had to deal with the family and there's your audience of a thousand odd people waiting for your first, second, third note. Have you ever, yeah. t- how do you, how do you cope with that? Um, I think the moment you set foot on stage, um, well, for me, I, I enter a, it's a, it's a different, it's a different world. It's, it's not a different me. Um, it's still me, but it's, um, you know, I always describe it as my, as my stage persona, because, um, you know, when you're doing the mundane things in, in life, when you're, when you're, um, doing the grocery shopping and when you're, or if you're, if you're on the road and you're sort of remotely parenting, Mm. um, you have to be able to, you have to be able to kind of switch off and become that other part of you the more creative the the more outgoing the more the more exciting version of yourself if you like and that's and um I'm just very used to automatically I can automatically shift into that mode the moment I I walk on stage um and whatever I'm involved in if I'm touring with the Brooklyn Funk Essentials for example um the energy that you get from the audience helps you to focus and Mm. I I don't know it's just like flicking a switch um just going into just going into performance mode and 
you can leave those things behind while you're on stage. I mean, don't get me wrong. The moment I'm in the, the dressing room afterwards, if there is something going on or, you know, or you're feeling that kind of frazzle, then I'll be checking my phone straight away. But yeah. for that time that you're, that you're on stage, it kind of allows you to, to step into a different, a different world. And I think that's the thing that I, that I love so much about, about music, you know, music is, it's nonverbal communication. For me, it's like, it's, it's always been like a kind of therapy. And the more that may be going on um, elsewhere, whatever chaos is, is happening or whatever family, you know, situations or, or whatever, um, as soon as I pick up my saxophone and I start playing, all my frustration or all my, whatever it might be, that goes straight down the saxophone. And okay. I feel fantastic afterwards. Yeah. It literally, if I don't play for... A week for example i feel i feel like something's wrong i feel like yes. something's kind of missing and as soon as i get my sax out and i play i always say that is my therapy that's my you know i i tell my story down the saxophone when i when i play you know i you know it's not always been an easy ride for me over the last sort of 20 years or so and um i just the poor saxophone just bears the brunt of it basically <laughs> I just pick up the sax and, ah, and that's it. And then whew, it's it's really therapeutic. So is that the Barry, the tenor, the alto, or the soprano? Which one gets it? Well, um, <laughs> I suppose, I mean, my heart really lies in tenor saxophone and it always has been because that was the first sax that I, that I ever managed to get my hands on. And I was desperate to get a saxophone by the time I was, oh, I was 12 when I started playing the sax. Oh. And uh, I got this really clapped out, um, tennis saxophone from the county music service that was in the bottom of a cupboard somewhere that everyone had forgotten about and it didn't work properly and mm. it was full of leaks and you know uh. it, the notes didn't come out <laughs> yeah but I, I I absolutely I completely fell in love with it and I suppose that's why for me tenor it's got that meatiness it's got that um it's just a really gutsy sound and I I think I love the tenor saxophone because that's where I hear when I'm improvising I hear at that kind of pitch okay um and or that kind of tone um mm. just really really resonates with me yeah. um so I, and i tend to play um the, the the thing is i tend to play very high on the tenor saxophone in altissimo register which you and i know is yeah. basically higher than the notes which exist yes you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um uh and i don't know i there's something about that kind of area of the saxophone that's um, that I feel really allows me to kind of express myself. Mm. Um, alto, I love very much as well. Mm -hmm. I think I love them all as much. But um, so in um, Jules Holland's Rhythm and Blues Orchestra, I play alto saxophone. And tenor, tenor is where my heart really, really lies. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe there's just one uh, one instrument where you feel you can really, really express yourself and all that just really resonates with you. And I think tenor sax is the one yeah. for me in that respect. But I I, I love them all. Um, so I think alto would be next. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoy playing alto in, uh, in Jules Holland's band. Um, it's different just different different sound it's you know it's cuts through more and it's obviously there you're playing part of a, of a playing as part of a five-piece saxophone section and mm. um it's really great sort of blending with everybody else's sound and um in fact my it's interesting because my <clears throat> my jazz album that i released <clears throat> excuse me mm back in 2003 yeah. which is a long time ago now was there was no tenor saxophone on it it was alto sax and a little bit of soprano and yeah. i sometimes you know i come across it or somebody mentions it and i think how bizarre actually that i didn't play any tenor sax on mm. that and i probably have gone through phases as well where i've really enjoyed playing soprano really enjoyed playing alto but tenor is my that's where my heart is <laughs> yeah it's, it's interesting um i've just i mean that's just piqued another question i mean you you know about the 2003 that you love the tenor but you were an alto so maybe it's something that maybe that's getting a bit too psychological let's go back you were 12 <laughs> you were 12 yes. when you picked up the saxophone and you explained yeah. it was at the bottom um of the of the cupboards all on yeah. its own and you fell in love with it which is kind of cool so what's been the journey for you with your instrument from 12 years old up to where you are now um my saxophone was the last instrument that i took up 
Um, oh, so you had an instrument before the saxophone? Then. Yeah, I started. Oh. To, uh, I started piano when I was, I think, I was four. Okay. My brother was going for piano lessons at the local with a local piano teacher, um, and I think I was potentially more interested in the piano than he was at the time because they let me start my lessons early. I must have. I don't know, maybe I just kept going up and playing it when I shouldn't have some, or something, because I do remember sitting and, and jiggling whilst his piano lessons were going on. Yeah. But so, so they let me start earlier than they normally would, because I mm. must have shown some kind of unnatural interest in the piano. <laughs> mm. uh, so we started that, loved the piano. And then when I was eight, um, uh, I was living in Leicestershire. I moved to the, the Midlands, actually, when I, when I, I, I lived in Leicestershire till I was eight. Then I moved okay. away to Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk and then came back here when I was a student and, and I've stayed ever since. But when I was just before we moved, when I was about seven or eight, I was um, at school in Leicestershire and we were coming down for assembly. And I heard what to me was the most amazing sound I've ever heard. And it was the school orchestra. In yeah. retrospect, it probably yeah. didn't sound that amazing. <laughs> but to me, yeah. I was completely spellbound. Yeah. And I remember walking into the school hall and I saw people playing the violin and I thought well, I want to do that so I took up the violin when I was eight yeah and then saxophone when I was 12 and I actually studied all three of them through to through to grade eight oh. um but the, but it was the saxophone although it was the last one that I picked up it was the one that I completely fell in love with and that came most naturally yeah. to me um so from the age of 12, I think I, I was self-taught on the saxophone as well. Um, I had a couple of lessons just before I did my grade eight. And then I went and studied at the Birmingham Conservatoire. So it was really, I was just playing. I was in every band I could basically fit into in, in one week. I was very lucky to be in a place where there was a lot music in, in Suffolk there was a fantastic music service so I was in you know wind bands and jazz orchestras I was in um, choir um, and um, the county orchestra um, every possible opportunity that I had I would be rehearsing and playing um, either saxophone or violin but mostly saxophone mm. um, so I was I was just playing whenever I whenever I could um, until I went to the conservatoire where I studied formally mm. and actually studied classical saxophone, but um, started to teach myself jazz when I was in my third year. There was no jazz course at the time at the conservatoire. Okay. So I started to teach myself because I desperately wanted to improvise and play jazz, but I didn't have the confidence to do it until I was 21, which is quite bizarre really because it's, it's what I do now is improvisation and jazz and funk and pop and you know and yet I was um, studying classical music um, and you know completely classically trained but that I think has been really really crucial to my musical development as well you know, I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> I think um, an interesting thing you're saying here is that obviously it was a classical route um, in your early stages up to 21 and then you transitioned into jazz mm. so you know, there's sometimes a bit of a debate. Is it important to have done a degree in music um, hmm. or not? Is it important to read or not? I mean, where do you fall in, in those things? Yeah, that's a really interesting one. I think um, you don't have to have you don't have to have a degree in music. Yeah. Um, n not at all. Um, but. But you need to you need to know your craft, you know, um, but that I don't there are there are many different ways of uh, of of getting to, for example, the place that I'm that there could have been many different ways to to be doing the things that I do without um, a university degree. And, you know, ironically, I, I sometimes say to people the things that I do professionally, the particular sort of areas that I work professionally as a music arranger, I'm completely self-taught. I never had a music arranging lesson in my life. And yet okay. I've arranged th theater shows and all kinds of stuff, but I'm self-taught. So, um, you know, I, I'm a Sibelius um, notation software user, everything I've taught my myself um, and the improvisation and um, everything that I do in the sort of jazz, pop, funk, 
field. Um, I, I didn't have any lessons in that. I've had wow. lots of, and, um, you know, and I teach my, myself now at the Birmingham Conservatoire. Um, so I'm teaching on the classical course, but my sort of niche within that is that I'm teaching the classical musicians um, improvisation, not just when I say jazz, it's not mm-hmm. jazz, it's, you know, it's everything that has come from jazz, sort of yeah. forms of improvisation. Mm-hmm. But again, a lot of that, well, I, I've, I've taught myself. So, um Yes, I, I I I had four years to work on my performance really at the Birmingham Conservatoire mm-hmm. um, because it was a performance degree that I did, and those four years of practice and um, you know amazing tuition um, from from my teachers, definitely that has made my saxophone playing what it is. But there are so many other aspects of what I do that I've actually just learned myself. And that's really good to hear because. Um... Uh, I'm, 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 I like what you're saying, and I like the fact that you are, as a woman, self-taught. Technology yeah. is fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A lot of people who aren't self-taught, and they always say, "Oh, but I can't read," you know, or I hadn't mm. gone to university. I'm like, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. You know? Yeah, I mean, it depends what sort of what sort of music you're playing. And I work mm. professionally with musicians who do read and musicians who don't read. And I've yeah. I've been in a lot of bands with with um, with a mix of with a mix of both and. You know, if you read music, there is no, there's no doubt about it. You you can potentially get more employment because you can do a reading gig. You can mm. turn up. You can. You don't have to rely on memory for everything. You can write, you know, stuff out. But if you're there are there are two different types of people and there are some that fall in between so you can get the readers Mm -hmm. and the non-readers and obviously the non-readers can't do the reading gigs but the readers sometimes are so stuck on the music that they don't (laughs) that they don't have the feel that you would have if you're not reading so if I'm doing a gig um I don't like to read music Mm. um I like to learn it and perform from memory. And I might have started off with a chart that I've written myself, or I might have start started off with music that someone else has given me. But I I, I will memorize it because I feel that I give a better performance. Yeah, you're bringing the heart and soul into it, then you're not. Yeah, sort of and I, I don't like to be stuck behind a music stand. Having said that, you know, again, it's dependent on what sort of do um with um jules's rhythm and blues orchestra there is a phenomenal amount of music mm. you know and who wouldn't want to realizing that because you would can, can guarantee that you would be the one in the big band who goes Purp, in the wrong place you know <laughs> <laughs> when the rest of the band is taking a couple of beats rest and you think it's there i don't want to be that person so i'm going to read the music in that situation you know what i mean <laughs> having said that occasionally i still do go Purp, <laughs> in the wrong place if I'm <laughs> <laughs> that's funny i know i, I can see it now that's all and yeah. you're looking at her, i think it worked me it worked me <laughs> yeah yeah i usually own up to it if i just go in fact i i i, I like to yeah. i like to own it and be bold and proud and i always say to okay. my students if you play a wrong note play it loud and proud and then afterwards yes. in fact i did it just last week we were rehearsing with the band and i did a classic in the wrong place the whole band's playing in unison and just yeah. i was just one quaver out yeah i just stick my hand up and go thank you very much that's my moment <laughs> that's all about me thank you thank you thank you spotlight here <laughs> exactly <laughs> i'll take that one yeah yeah so <laughs> you've, you've got to remember it's always only one little moment in time it's like when you're on stage and you think you've done something horrendous that mm. people will go oh my goodness did you hear what she did but it's a moment in time and it passes and we're human beings yeah, you know yeah definitely <laughs> definitely so you mentioned about um, the different routes to different things yeah. I want to be able to say something about that because when I have people are listening, you're thinking, well, how do I become a ranger or how do I play for Brooklyn Funk Essentials or how do I play yeah. for, not necessarily those bands, but yeah. what are the sort of routes that you spot as you were going through the music industry for people to, or musicians to, to navigate or to, to take? Um, that's a tricky one. Um, I mean, it's a very personal thing. I think, you know, for, for me, the the way that i the way that i've been able to join these bands is literally from from the very beginning i i can only ever give 100% so i can't i'm completely incapable of doing a half-hearted job on anything which over all aspects of my life which drives me insane because it means if i start cleaning the house then every little 
into you know I'm, I'm, I can be a little bit obsessive like that sometimes okay. I can't do a half-hearted job I'm an all or nothing person mm. so um with music um I will throw myself into a project 100 percent um and I think, and I and I work really, really hard, and um, you know, I make sure if I'm learning material that I will know something inside out and back to front. Mm. Um, and I think, and also, you know, practicing, really knowing my craft. You, pe- people do notice. You might not think, mm. but people do notice. So, for example, um, I I became a member of the Brooklyn Funk Essentials. It, through it started with an email um, that just appeared out of nowhere when I was sitting. Um, I was actually at the time, as well as being a music arranger, I'm a, what they call a music preparation specialist. So sometimes I will work on scores and look for two notes that might be squashed up against each other and or look for mistakes and correct them in a score. So I, I, I did this for a lot of the music for um, Doctor Who and Torchwood about I don't know, 10 years or so ago. I, I, so I was sitting one night on a very short deadline. I think I had till two o'clock in the morning to finish working on a score for Doctor Who. I wasn't composing the music, wasn't mm-hmm. arranging the music. I was literally looking at the scores and making sure that nothing was in the wrong place. It was yeah. really meticulous sort of work. And this email arrived in my inbox from a man called Ivan Van Hetten, mm-hmm. um, who I'm now engaged to. <laughs> I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And um, we've been together for uh, nearly 10 years now. We okay. were supposed to we were supposed to have been married in April, but obviously with the, with the situation oh, we've had yeah. to postpone. Um, and this, you know, a, a, an, an email arrived saying, um, you know, I've, I've been passed on your name and um, basically I've checked you out on the Internet and we're looking for someone to tour with us. And I wondered if you might be interested. Mm. Um, and, you know, looked the band up and thought, wow, this is fantastic. I would have been interested to tour at that point anyway, but to tour with a band where you absolutely love the music, it's just, that's, an, that's a blessing. Yeah. And, you know, it's it seems like that has dropped out of nowhere. But actually, when I asked later, you know, well, where did you get where did yeah. you get my name from? Yeah. Um, you know, apparently my name had had come up a few times Mm. um and this is an international band so they were sort of looking worldwide um and i guess the thing is your name comes up enough times from people that you've worked with who've been impressed by the way that you've played or your professionalism and you know Mm -hmm. um that actually what you don't realize is that every gig that you go to and every performance you 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 give you are building your reputation you know every every single time and people do start to talk and you you know you might not be aware of it but that's why it's so important to always give your best always play your best always turn up on time always you know always take care of your appearance because what you don't always realize is that you're you're laying down those foundations for someone to then give you a recommendation that may lead to another recommendation and you know you start moving in different circles and you know maybe gradually sort of moving up the ladder which is what has happened throughout my career and I think also having your own having your own material out there as well you know I was fortunate enough back when I recorded my jazz album with the Anna Brooks Quintet back in 2003 I was fortunate enough to have been um, commissioned by the Jerwood um, Music Foundation um, to write music for a performance at the Cheltenham Jazz Festival and then somebody heard that when I was playing the same music at the Brecon Jazz Festival and then they said we've got a new record company and we'd like to sign you and I thought nonsense that's just you know people tell you things at gigs and you're like yeah yeah and I literally was backstage going yeah yeah I got a recording studio yeah yeah Yeah. but it it was a a kosher thing and um again you know it's it's these little every gig that you do and every new opportunity um you take advantage of and you take on board you're sowing the seeds for things that you, you don't realize that then happen further down the line i like that Mm. because i think there are some people who feel as though 
they don't have to do a gig that they've got a great craft you know be the voice an instrument or whatever and that someone should just see them in the crowd point at them and say we want to sign you from major label or something without having done the work (laughs) yeah that's the thing you've got to do the journey haven't you I think yeah you have to do the journey and Mm. for some people they may be very lucky and that may happen Mm. but um yeah that's it, that would be luck you happen to be in the in and there is an element of luck as well I suppose but you know happening to be in the in the right place at the, the right time but mm, yeah I think that's also part of the culture that we live in where people think um oh I can you know maybe just get a social media presence and then something amazing will happen yes yeah no yeah. you've got to you know it's years and years of practice yes years and years yeah. of hard work and experience you know um you know I'm no spring chicken I've got a few i got a few years <laughs> in my career under my belt you know yeah, yeah. but um that that's you know um you will know what to do in certain situations in gigs you'll know how to how to to play in different situations mm. you know how to deal with different musical situations mm. and you know um experience has got a lot to do with it as well and i think that's why sometimes you see people who um, may not be so experienced hitting the big time and then falling off the rails. Yeah. Because everything is so new and so overwhelming. Yeah. Know? You've got to have a foundation <laughs> and the network to kind of ground you, really, haven't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you've mentioned COVID and you are a full time musician. I, I probably shouldn't assume that. I am. You are. Yes. Right, yes. Musician. This is the only job I have ever done. While people right. were stacking. Uh, stacking shelves at the supermarkets at the age of 16 I was playing the piano in a ballet school (laughs) so that's my only that's the only other job job that I've ever done yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. so you've maintained a full-time career um are there any sort of we're going to come to some tips later so maybe I'll hold fire on that maybe that's something you can bring up the tips for being a full-time musician but um as a full-time musician and you you tour how many women do you see female musicians do you meet on the way let's 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 go there (laughs) okay yeah right not enough right not enough Mm. and I but but the good thing is that I do think it does seem to be changing yeah um but yeah I've been in so many situations um where I am often the only female in the band Mm. um and I'm kind of used to that but it it makes me it makes me sad to be to be honest but it's 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 very difficult I think to be or maybe it's more difficult for uh women to be on the road if you have a family um you know I didn't I didn't really start touring um for any length of time until my boys were I think they were 11 um and until up to that point you know maybe I would be away for one or two days and that was um it was it was partly by choice it was also partly because um of where my career was at at the time um so it it is difficult to Mm. to leave young children behind um it is harder for us I think um and of course you know, men have the same thing. They're away from their, they're away from their families, and and that is difficult. But it's perhaps a little bit harder for mummy to be away yeah. for for large periods of time. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I've had plenty of situations uh, where I've been, for example, as a as a female musical director, where I've turned up and I'm in charge of, um, you know, a, a seven piece band and maybe eight singers, and I've turned up at a theatre show and, you know someone will say to me oh are you are you one of the singers or are you know and no I'm the musical director and (laughs) and you know it's still as I say it's getting better but you do see surprise faces and I think um uh I used to I used to put my more feminine side to one side Mm. um and you know even uh, even in the way that I the way that I dressed uh because um I felt like this is you know we're going back to maybe 10-15 years um I felt like I had to be this very sort of strong person um because of what I was doing and because there was often the assumption that oh you know she's in that band because she looks a certain way wait till you hear her play the saxophone it's going to be rubbish but then yeah 
yeah it's, it's, I know it one. isn't and then you see oh actually and so many times I've heard you know actually you can play but I think I I think I I felt like I had to be sort of very strong and maybe be more manlike yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, just because of you know, the, maybe the, the nature of the business and the, the work that I was doing. Mm. Um, I always felt like I had to prove myself, mm. you know, mm. um, always, um, yeah, I always felt like I had to, to really prove myself. And at some point I thought, I think the older you get, the less you care about what other people think about you, which is hallelujah for that, yes, by the yes, way. Um, yes. That's the great thing about getting older. Um, yeah. But I think these days I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more able to, to, to be my more feminine self and um, not feel like I have to prove myself so much because I know that people at some point will find out, oh, yes, actually, she, she really can play the saxophone and she really does know what she's doing then. She's not there to be the token female, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, well, so, but, yeah, I, I would love to see more. I would love to see more women out there. Yeah. Um, I really, really would. Um, just the nature of the business it's so it's there's a lot of men doing this and not so many women but um it's great that there are more people and and there's more awareness of this now as well and i think um you need to i think people need to you need to see it to be it right yeah, so if yeah. we have more um female musician role models out there then more young girls will go well i can be a rock guitarist and yeah. you know and that is really really improving you know yeah. i were obviously working in education um and working with um young adults um because as well as teaching at the birmingham conservatory i, I have been um involved in teaching um at both um, acm and bim in the past and which are more you know contemporary sort of pop music university if you like yeah, yeah. rather than and, and obviously there's a there's quite um there's a bit of a, a, a male rock culture that could be associated with that but they're both doing really really good jobs at encouraging females and putting more um more female role, role models out there um which is great Fantastic. Mm, wow i really can't wait to share with you the rest of anna's interview you know she's going to tell you about what it's like coping with covid19 and how it's the sort of upended her career but you know what she's keep trucking she's doing stuff and she's going to tell you all about that she's going to give you tips for transitioning your career and also she's going to talk about you know starting her music in a i think she's around 26 after she had her children and you know she went on to make it a success she's got recordings and she's even engaged to a platinum recording musician how cool is that well listen while you're waiting check out seasons one season two of my podcast and why not grab yourself a copy of my free e-booklet called revealed 25 secrets of the successful gigging musician singer rapper and spoken word artist the link is in the description speak to you soon bye for now